is the body of Christ the bride of Christ? So let's make sure we understand what the question is. So today during the dispensation of grace, which is the time period in which we live, the church is called the body of Christ. In other words, when someone believes the gospel today, they are spiritually placed into the church that God is forming, and that church is called the body of Christ. The body of Christ has a future destiny where it will be caught up to heaven at the rapture. The question that we're going to start with is simply this. Is the church, the body of Christ, is that the bride of Christ? And so that's the question we want to look at. So we're going to start with our old friend Blue Letter Bible. So let's just go there and uh, we'll get this to refresh. Isn't this exciting? It was there a moment ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to uh, type the word bride, and I'll use the wild card there, the asterisk at the end. And, and notice I'm going to go to advanced options. So I'm going to click advanced options. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to set a search range. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it for the Pauline epistles. And why am I setting it for the Pauline epistles? Well, the question that we're considering is, is the body of Christ the bride of Christ. Well, if it was, who would write about that? It would be Paul, right? Because Paul was given the revelation of the mystery. He was given the dispensation of grace. He was given the revelation of the existence of the body of Christ. So if the church is in fact the bride of Christ, if the body of Christ is in fact the bride of Christ, Paul would be the one to tell us. So we're going to run the word bride in Paul's epistles, and we're going to then look at each of the hits that comes up. So let's run it. Look what we found. Uh, zero. So does Paul use the term bride or brides? He doesn't, period. It, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Pauline epistles. So you could look at that and you could say, well, okay, this was a really easy question. Paul never says we're the bride of Christ, so that's, that's it. Game over. We're done. Well, this is going to be a longer program than that, so let's keep studying. What I want to show you is, get with me Revelation chapter 21. Get Revelation chapter 21. Now, by the way, so if you think about what we just did there, so we ran the search uh, for bride, and we did it within just Paul's epistles. Once we got no hits, the proper thing to do is to change our range to the whole Bible, run it again, and of course, we're going to get all of these verses. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip to some particular verses that I think we should look at. So let's get to Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21. All right. Now look with me at verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So in Revelation 21, 2, we see the bride analogy, the bride metaphor. But what is it a reference to? Is it a reference to the body of Christ? No. Some would say it's a reference to the kingdom church, but what does the verse actually say? What is it that is prepared as a bride? Well, it's the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So in, in verse 2, it seems that the bride is actually the new Jerusalem itself. Let's keep reading. Go down to verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, that's a fascinating verse. It specifically says, I will show thee the bride, and then it says, what, what? The capital L, Lamb's wife? Well, who's the Lamb? The capital L, Lamb, is obviously Jesus Christ. So what's being referred to here seems awfully, awfully, awfully close to the bride of Christ because it's the bride, the Lamb's wife. So this is pretty much the bride of Christ. Look at verse 10. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Well, let's put these two verses together. Verse 9 says, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. In other words, I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to show you who the bride is. And in verse 10, it specifically says, He showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. So if you were going by the scriptures, who is the bride of Christ? Well, it seems pretty obvious it's the new Jerusalem, right? I mean, verse 2, it's the new Jerusalem that's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 9 says, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And in verse 10, who does, who is, what does he show? He shows the, the holy Jerusalem. So it seems really simple, doesn't it, that the bride of Christ is a reference to the new Jerusalem. Now let me give you a couple other things to consider. There are two really big reasons that the bride of Christ wouldn't seem to be the body of Christ. The first is, as we saw earlier, Paul never uses the term bride. So how can the body of Christ be the bride of Christ if Paul never even uses the term? That would seem to be a pretty powerful argument. The second is, get with me Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And in Ephesians 2, we're going to look at verse 13, or we'll start in verse 13. We're going to read a couple verses. Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he, that's Jesus Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, notice this, for to make in himself of twain, that means two, one new man, so making peace. So the, the church in Ephesians 2 verses 13 to 15 is described as the one new man. So think through this for a minute. If the body of Christ is one new man, then it's not the bride. It can't be, right? I mean, in other words, Ephesians 2 specifically tells you that what God is forming today is making of twain, that's Jews and Gentiles, one new man, that's the body of Christ. Well, then obviously the body of Christ is not the bride of Christ. So from everything we've looked at so far, Paul never uses the term bride. So how could the body of Christ be the bride of Christ? The body of Christ is one new man, so how could the body of Christ be the bride of Christ? And oh, by the way, if you go by the scriptures, the bride, the lamb's wife, is specifically said to be the new Jerusalem. So we're done, right? The body of Christ is not the bride of Christ. However, get with me Romans chapter 7. So if you just go by everything we've seen so far, it's a pretty easy and, and simple issue, isn't it? But look with me at Romans 7, verse 4. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye, these are the people that Paul's writing to, it's the saints in Rome. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. How did they do that? By the body of Christ that ye should be married to another. Okay, what's going on here? The saints in Romans 7 verse 4 are dead to the law. How are they dead to the law? By the body of Christ. In other words, they got dead to the law by being in the body of Christ. And what's their purpose for being in the body of Christ? That ye should be married to another. Okay, well, who's that? Even to him who is raised from the dead. So that's sort of a, that's a little different verse, isn't it? Because that verse is saying that the body of Christ is married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. That's obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. So the body of Christ there is described as being married to the Lord Jesus Christ. Get 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you, the you obviously being the Corinthian saints, they're members of the body of Christ. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you, that's the Corinthian saints again, to one husband. So the 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 saints there are espoused to one husband. Then notice what the next part of the verse says, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So what are we seeing here? Does Paul use the term bride? He doesn't use the term bride, but in Romans 7, 4, he talks about the body of Christ being married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. That's Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, they're espoused to one husband. They're essentially a fiancé that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ? Doesn't that look an awful lot like the body of Christ is the bride to Christ? I mean, doesn't it look like that? I realize it doesn't use the word, but doesn't it look like that? And then you think, well, but wait a minute. Ephesians 2 said that the body of Christ was one new man. So how does this all fit together? You know, one point of view is to say, well, this is all... Of course, it doesn't fit together because the Bible's full of mistakes. And so it says contradictory things and errors and so on. Well, that's, that's not a reasonable explanation. And, and just to quickly deal with that, if God can speak the universe into existence, if he can literally create the universe out of nothing, it's not real hard for him to write a book that says what he wants. The book says what he wants. The issue is we need to understand what it's telling us. The flaw is not in his preservation. The flaw is in our understanding. So we need to, we need to think about this. We need to study and we need to understand what Scripture is trying to tell us. So get with me Hosea 12, verse 10. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. What we're going to do during the rest of our time is we're going to try to understand how to reconcile these different similitudes. In other words, these are different comparisons. At one point, the body of Christ is called the one new man. Another time, it's described as being married to him that is raised from the dead. Another time, it's described as a chaste virgin. There are different descriptions of the body of Christ, and those descriptions are not always the same. They they seem inconsistent in some ways. Well, look with me at Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, notice this, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Scripture has many similitudes. Those are comparisons, those are similes, those are metaphors, those are figurative symbols, and there's many of them. And the key is how to understand them. So I'm going to take a different example outside the Bible just for a minute. Think of the phrase, faster than. So in other words, let's say you see someone running or you see a car going really fast, What we often do is we often use figurative language to describe what the object is doing. So, for example, I I found this list on the Internet. I'll just read it to you. Faster than lightning. You've probably heard that phrase. Faster than a speeding bullet. That's the one that I hear most often. Faster than a wink of an eye. Faster than a dog with a bone. Faster than you can say whatever. Well, all of those are different expressions for communicating how fast something is. But but notice this with me, if you would. All of those comparisons are about speed, but the objects compared are very different. So, for example, one said faster than lightning, 
One said faster than a speeding bullet. One of those said faster than you can say, faster than a wink of an eye. Well, those, those things being compared are very different. Lightning is not at all like a speeding bullet. Lightning goes down, a speeding bullet goes this way. So the directions are different. A speeding bullet is, you know, is, is metal. It, it, it has a physical substance to it. Lightning is, is, is light. That's different. The wink of an eye is different than lightning. Uh, a dog with a bone is different. My, my point is, if you look at all of those expressions, all of those similitudes, what they have in common is their reference to speed, their reference to velocity. But the objects themselves are very, very different. Now, my point in telling you that is this. When Scripture uses a similitude, you need to understand the particular aspect, the particular manner in which it is being used. It's not being used typically to apply in every single particular. So let's take an example together. You ready? Get Matthew 13, verse 31. Now, what's interesting about what we're about to look at is we're going to look at Matthew 13, 31, and we're going to look at a number of verses in Matthew 13. We'll actually go to, we may go to some other places in Matthew as well, but for, for now, let's start in Matthew 13. So look at Matthew 13, 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some more verses here, but I want you to notice this. All of these verses are going to say, the kingdom of heaven is like. And what, what the verses are going to do is it's going to compare the kingdom of heaven to a, a particular thing. So just to be clear, we're looking during the Lord's earthly ministry, right before the cross, it's about the kingdom of heaven. Now, you recall that John the Baptist showed up preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what we're going to read about it in, in Matthew 13 and, and some of the other places in Matthew is descriptions of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And what you'll see is that it's like a bunch of different things that are not similar. So, Matthew 13, 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. And, of course, a mustard seed is a very, very tiny, very small seed. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. Well, verse 31 said the kingdom of heaven was like a mustard seed. Verse 33 says it's like leaven. What about verse 44? Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Let's go to verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man. Verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net. Verse 52. Matthew 13, 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder. Now there's other examples we could go to, but let's just sort of you know, sum up the point here. The kingdom of heaven, just in this chapter, just in this chapter, all in the same context, says the kingdom of heaven is like the following things. A mustard seed, leaven, treasure hid in a field, a merchant man, a net, and a householder. Now, are those things the same? Well, one of them was a merchant man. Do you ever meet a merchant man? The first thing you think is, well, he really looks like a mustard seed. They're not at all similar. They're different in size. They're different in function. One is living. One is not. One is a treasure hid in the field. Another is leaven. You can bake with leaven. You don't bake with treasure hid in the field. The point is, all of these similitudes, they're all true because they're in the Scripture. None of them are false. They're all true. But it would be wrong to take the similitude and say, the kingdom of heaven 
is exactly like a treasure hid in a field in all particulars. It's not. I mean, if you did that, what you could say is, well, here's what you should do with a little flock. You should bury them in the ground. You shouldn't do that. The point is what you need to do is you need to look at the passage and you need to understand the aspect of the similitude that Scripture is trying to teach. It's not saying that the kingdom of heaven is like this particular object or metaphor in every single aspect. It's saying it's like that in a particular way that it tells you. So one more time and then we'll go on. Every similitude in the scriptures is true. It's accurate. It's correct. God put it there. So all of them, you know, all of them are accurate. But but you need to, to not try to extend it beyond how Scripture uses it. It's, it. it's wrong to go beyond Scripture. Now let me show you this. Scripture will frequently use inconsistent similitudes to describe the same thing. In other words, what I'm saying there is Scripture will sometimes use different similitudes to describe the same thing And those similitudes themselves will be inconsistent or contradictory. So look with me at Revelation 22, verse 13. Revelation 22 and verse 13. Revelation 22, 13. Now notice what it says here about the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, obviously, each of those things is opposites, right? One is is essentially A, one is Z. One is beginning, one is end, one is first, one is last. Which is it? Well, both are true. Both are true. Uh, But obviously, they're they're different, aren't they? Look with me at 1 Peter 1.19. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 19. And so let's look at uh, some other similitudes used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So in 1 Peter 1, 19, Jesus Christ is likened unto a lamb, and that makes sense. Lambs were animals that were sacrificed, and, and, and lambs are harmless, and so it, you can understand why Jesus Christ would be likened unto a lamb. And in fact, earlier when we were in Revelation 21, remember how it referred to in verse 9, Revelation 21, 9, the, the, the bride, the lamb's wife? So we understand that in Scripture, that Jesus Christ is often likened to a lamb. But notice with me Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And and tell me who this verse is referring to once you look at it. Revelation 5, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the capital L lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, who's that? It's a capital L lion, so it must be a pretty special lion. And then notice what it says next. The root, capital R, root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Well, who's Revelation 5, 5 talking about? It's obviously talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So wait a minute. First Peter said that, that Jesus Christ was like a lamb. Revelation 5 says that he's like a lion. Well, are lambs and lions different? Get with me 1 Samuel 17. Verse 34, 1 Samuel 
17 and verse 34. 1 Samuel 17, 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. What happened in 1 Samuel 17, verse 34? Well, there was a lion that came along, and what did it do? It grabbed the lamb, took the lamb. So are, are lions and lambs, does one prey upon the other? Are they different? Are they somewhat, are they adversaries in some sense, right? Lions prey on lambs. So how can Jesus Christ be the lion of the tribe of Judah and, and the lamb without spot? How can he be both? Well, the answer is he obviously has to be both because Scripture says he is both. But what this tells us is this. In applying these similitudes, it's wrong to do the following. Well, Jesus Christ is a lamb in every single aspect. He's not because there's ways in which he's a lion. The point is that what you have to do with similitudes is you have to understand the particular point that is being made because Scripture will frequently use inconsistent similitudes to describe the same thing, the same person or the same thing. Let me give you another example. Are you ready? So we're going to get Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Ephesians 6, 16. Now, this passage deals with the armor of God. Let's take a look at it. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And so one of the pieces of the armor of God described in Ephesians 6, 16 is the shield of faith. Now, I don't know if you've ever read a lot about this, but what happens is, when you read sometimes about the armor of God, people will go into great detail and they'll describe the shape of the shield and what parts of the body it protected and how it was held, and they'll go into all sorts of details about that. Well, get with me, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, notice this, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Well, wait a minute. Ephesians 6, which is sort of the, the classical, the quintessential passage in the Word of God on the armor, says that faith is a shield. But 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says that faith is what? It's a breastplate. Well, are a shield and breastplate the same? I mean, they're not, right? A shield is, is held with, with the, the arm, the hand, and the breastplate, of course, is worn over the, the chest, the thorax. It's not the same. So which is it? Is, is faith a shield or a, a breastplate? Well, apparently it's, it's both in some sense, because Scripture says it is, but you can, see the, you can see that these similitudes are a little bit different, aren't they? Let's do a similar comparison. Now, you're in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. Keep that, or let's, just, let's read 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8 one more time, and then we're going to go back to Ephesians 6. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And so what I want you to notice before we turn is that 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 says that the breastplate is faith and love. Now keep that thought, but go to Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14. Ephesians 6.14 
Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now that's a tricky problem, isn't it? Because what we were looking at before is faith was said to be a shield and it was said to be a breastplate. And that's fine because you could wear a shield and a breastplate made of the same material. You could wear a shield of metal and a breastplate of metal. But what Ephesians 6.14 and 1 Thessalonians 5.8 say is one says the breastplate is of righteousness. Another says it's the breastplate is of faith and love. Well, do you ever see anyone with a coat of armor that has two breastplates? I mean, you can't do it. It, it, it would, it, it's hard enough wearing armor because it weighs you down. You don't wear two breastplates. So what's going on here? How, how can it be that it's the breastplate of righteousness and the breastplate of faith and love? Well, the, the answer is that obviously both verses are true, but it's obvious that it would be a mistake to, to press the similitude beyond how Scripture is using it. I don't know if you've ever done this. I've read things about how, well, the breastplate is the breastplate of righteousness because righteousness protects the heart and the heart is protected by the breastplate. And they go into all these details that, you know, my opinion might be private interpretation because Scripture itself tells you not to extend this similitude too far because in a parallel passage, what does it say? Well, the breastplate isn't righteousness. It's faith and love. Let's take a different question. Are you ready? Here is the question. So as you think about Abraham, is Abraham the father of the kingdom church, or is Abraham the father of the body of Christ? Which is it? Well, get with me James chapter 2, verse 21. James chapter 2 and verse 21. Now James, as you likely recall, James 1.1 1, 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. James is, is clearly writing to kingdom saints. He's, he's writing to kingdom saints under the prophetic program. Now, Notice James 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Well, what, what James is doing there in writing to, he's writing to Jews, and he says Abraham was our father, and that, of course, makes sense because the, the nation of Israel descended from Abraham. So, is James, excuse me, is Abraham the father of the kingdom church? And the answer is yes, he is, because he's, he's the father to all of Israel. But get Romans chapter 4, verse 1 now, if you would. Get Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father. Well, when Paul says we, Paul's a member of the body of Christ. That, that's more than apparent from 1 Timothy chapter 1, 16. And he describes Abraham as our father. So apparently, Abraham is not simply a father to the nation of Israel. He is also a father to the body of Christ. Look with me at Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Galatians 3 and verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Isn't that fascinating? In other words, how do you become a child of Abraham? By faith. And obviously members of the body of Christ today become children of our father Abraham by having faith and getting into the body of Christ. Verse 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, 
in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So what, that, what those passages are telling us is, it's obviously the case that Abraham was the father of Israel. That's, that's more than obvious because his descendants are where the nation of Israel comes from. But Abraham is also specifically said in the scriptures to be the father of, of, of the body of Christ because uh, this, those which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So Abraham, in other words, is the father for not only the nation of Israel, but also the father for those who come to faith during the dispensation of grace. He's the father of both. Now let me try to pull all of this together. What I am not saying, I am not saying this, any of the similitudes in the Bible are wrong. They're not wrong. They're all the way that God wants them to be. But as you read them, do the similitudes say different things about the same object? The kingdom of heaven is described in multiple different ways. The body of Christ is described in multiple different ways. The armor of God is described in multiple different ways. So what are we supposed to do with those similitudes? Well, the key is this. Read the passage, read what the similitude says, and read the specific manner in which the similitude is said to apply. And apply the similitude in that manner and that manner only. Don't add private interpretations, things outside of the text, to, to what the text itself says. The text is right. The text will tell you how to understand the similitude. So let's go back to our question that we started with. Is the body of Christ the bride of Christ? Well, people debate about this endlessly. And if you want to say the answer is no, you can say, well, the answer is no because Revelation 21, the, the bride of Christ is the new Jerusalem, and Christ can't have more than one bride. Well, is that the way that the similitude necessarily works? Another way that you could argue it is you could say, well, the body of Christ is one new man, and so therefore the body of Christ can't be the bride of Christ. The problem with that is the kingdom of heaven is described in ways that are inconsistent with each other. Moreover, there are verses that specifically tell you where Paul says, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ, which is pretty close. I mean, isn't, it, isn't that making the point that the body of Christ has a relationship with Christ very much like a bride? Romans 7, 4 specifically says that we are to be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead. What I would suggest to you is this. As you think about similitudes, it's not productive to get into arguments about terminology. Is the body of Christ the bride of Christ or is it not? I'm not I don't know if that's a profitable thing to do. What is a profitable thing to do is to read all of the relevant verses, understand the similitudes, and most importantly, understand how Scripture applies them. That's what we need to do in being careful students of the Word of God. The Word of God will tell us what we need to know if we simply pay attention to it and believe what it says.